Creative Control with Vishkana is proud to welcome a new sponsor to the show, Granddad's Donuts. Oh, you've heard me talk about how amazing Granddad's Donuts is before on this show with people from Hamilton, Ontario, like Tara Lightfoot, Elliot Brood, and Jesse Lanza. But that doesn't do it justice. If you're tired of mediocre assembly line donuts, taste something old-fashioned and delicious. Granddad's Donuts, located in a plaza at 574 James Street North in Hamilton, Ontario. Go to granddads.ca for more info about amazing donuts. Kevin McDonald Show. Oh, 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 the Kevin McDonald Show. Oh, 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 the Kevin McDonald, Kevin McDonald Show. That's all. It's your turn. It's the Kevin McDonald Show. Kevin McDonald is an ingenious comedic performer and writer currently based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Originally from Toronto, McDonald is best known as a member of the hugely influential Canadian sketch troupe, The Kids in the Hall. This August marks the first anniversary of McDonald's inventive variety show podcast, Kevin McDonald's Kevin McDonald Show, a mix of sketch comedy and conversations and musical performances, which has featured guest turns from Mike Myers, Wallace Shawn, Rachel Dratch, Ted Leo, Michael Showalter, Craig Finn, Susanna Hoffs, Rob Cordry, and his fellow kids, Scott Thompson and Dave Foley, among many others. McDonald and I had a chat recently about living in Winnipeg, his idiosyncratic approach to comedy podcasts, John Lennon's perfect rock and roll life, the new wave of sketch comedy, news about the kids in the hall, and their upcoming appearance at a benefit show featuring Dave Thomas, Rick Moranis, and many of the original SCTV cast, and much more. Sponsored by Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts, this is the 333rd episode of Creative Control with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm very fine, thank you. Uh, except I just found out that I have a window seat uh, going to New York, and I'm a claustrophobic. Oh, no, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I'm, I'm an aisle guy myself. What, you couldn't get an aisle? Then, then here's the thing. I, and I, I am starting out the interview this way. Uh, <laughs> I called them. <laughs> I have, like, two flights there and two flights back because I live in a weird place called Winnipeg. I moved there because of a woman, but that's a different story. <laughs> that's for minute 22 of the interview. <laughs> uh, and um, I called every airline, and, they, uh, and I, I, I travel all the time. And uh, I made sure that I had a. I told them I was claustrophobic. I don't know if they believe me, but they have to believe me. And it's true, I am, I swear. And then uh, I thought I had an aisle seat, and then I just checked in and I saw that it wasn't an aisle seat. Uh, this story has no funny ending. Uh, <laughs> so then I, I just called in and said, Well, can you check in? We can't give you. So I have to fly. I have to go to my second airline and beg the person at the gate, but there may not be any aisle seats. That's my story. That's what's on my mind. Let's talk about comedy now. Well, now, so, hang on a second, though. There's something about claustrophobia and airplanes and aisle seats and windows that doesn't quite make sense to me let me put it to you this way because yeah. i'm an aisle seat i'm six foot two you're you're not a tall man are you i'm not a tall man i am five i was five eight and a half uh as i age i am now currently just five eight okay that's fine <laughs> that's fine so uh six two i like the aisle i like the free i am claustrophobic i like to be able to leave and not cross over yeah. people yeah. all that stuff but are you also not uh, as a claustrophobic are you not afraid are you agoraphobic because you're right by the window are you afraid of being by the window and seeing the death that could be in your future, you know, right out your window. Is that frightening to you? No, no, death in my future is fine. I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, the trouble I have with the window scene now, and it just happened a couple of years ago, uh, I was always mildly claustrophobic, and then I was, uh, again, taking a flight to New York, and I was sitting next to, um, it wasn't big people, it was two small children. And all of a sudden, I, I stared at them, uh, and I started sweating. Um, uh, their mother, who was in the next row, started worrying, I think, because I was staring at her children sweating. And I thought, um, because I know, I have to know that I have to move. That's what makes me unclaustrophobic. I mean, I have to know that I can move. Yes. Um, in an aisle seat, I know that if I had to, I, could, I can't move far, because you're in an airplane up in the sky. But uh, at least I know I can move a little bit. In, in, in the window seat, um, when, uh, when the people are squishing me in, 
Uh, I, I know I can't move. This is a great interview. Thank you very much. Right out the window. So much open space. I know, I know, and I can look at it, and I, I guess I could pretend that I'm out there flying, but uh, <laughs> my imagination has limits. <laughs> well, you mentioned that you are in uh, Winnipeg, Why? and it was for a woman, and you said that we couldn't talk about it until minute 22. Oh, that's okay. I released that hold. We could talk about it now. Okay, good, good. So why? What, what's going on in Winnipeg? Why are you in Winnipeg? I, I lived in Los Angeles for uh, 16 years, and then uh, I went um, in uh, 2009... I went to the Winnipeg Comedy Festival, and um, uh, I, I, the, the woman um, was an assistant to the um, the person who <laughs> ran the festival, who's an old comedy friend of the kids in the hall. And I, it's not her, but her uh, the, at the party afterwards, her best friend, a um, uh, dancer named Paula. And I met her, and then I eventually moved to Winnipeg. Oh, well, that's nice. You're not. Where are you from originally? Uh, I was born in Montreal, ironically, where I'll be begging someone to get an aisle seat tomorrow. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I, I, I'll use that. I was born here! And she'll be sarcastic and say, here at this gate? No, not at this gate! <laughs> well, I'm already it's going to be quite a scene that you're going to cause just for your aisle seat there. Yeah, that's interesting. That's right. And then I'll be arrested and handcuffed and really claustrophobic. <laughs> no, you, uh, you, but you, I grew up in Toronto. You grew up in Toronto. So Winnipeg, what's it like in Winnipeg? What's I heard there's a sinkhole in Winnipeg. That's the big news that I read uh, the other day. Is there? Oh, you don't even know? I thought it's the talk of the town. There's a big sinkhole. There's a lot of potholes. There probably is a sinkhole. You don't know about the sinkhole in Winnipeg? It's all everyone's talking about. Well, yeah, I'm going to go ask Winnipeg. I'm going to run out the house after this interview <laughs> and ask Winnipeg people. Well, don't fall in the sinkhole. If you run out of the house, it might be right there. You may not even know like, it. What, like, uh, like where is it? In a park? In the, in the street? I where, think where? it's in the street, in the, like in the downtown area. I only did a cursory read of this. I thought you would have sinkhole material at the ready, but no. No, uh, but you, there are a lot of like floods and the holes of water and, and, and stuff like that uh, that happen all the time. Yeah. That's... And it rained a lot yesterday, so I'm not surprised at the sinkhole news. Are you enjoying life in Winnipeg uh, after living in Los Angeles for 16 years? Am I enjoying the sinkhole life? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, yes, it's a nice um, uh, it's a nice small city, and it's got a nice artistic scene. Do you um, know the director, um, um, Guy Madden? Yes, uh, very well, yes. He's from here. Yes. And, uh, I see him every now The Weaker Thans? Yes, exactly. They, uh, they live down, no, they don't live down the street like the monkeys. So the, the, the main Weaker Than John lives down the street. With his wife, Christine Fellows, an amazing musician as well, yeah. Good for you. Yeah, so well, I'm, a, I'm a music person. Person, you know. Good for you. Yes, I, I see them every now and then. Wow, they, uh, they, uh, wow. That is, so you know, like Canadians. So you know about the tragically hip and Gord Downey. I'm, I know Gord. I saw Gord at the <laughs> Nick Cave show the other day. He was walking in. I talked to him for a little bit, and I saw him then. Like two days later, he walked past me at the Do Make Say Think show. So I. What city is this? This is Toronto. I, I go to. I visit Toronto. I live in Guelph. <laughs> I see. I see. I, li I live in Guelph, but I visit Toronto frequently. He's number one trending um, in uh, here in uh, Canada Yahoo now because because his work with indigenous people. Yes, that's right, and uh, and I, I mean you're in Winnipeg. That is a that is a well. Yes. there's some uh, stuff going on there. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, concerning the city as, as uh, well as many other cities in Canada. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, in any case, uh, Winnipeg is treating you well. Yes, uh, I have no complaints against um, the Winnipeg. Okay, okay. <laughs> now I've been enjoying your podcast very much. Congratulations! It's a uh, it's coming up on one year, right? Uh, yeah, it's you that told me that. I didn't know that. Um, uh, uh, that's like, um, uh, yeah, that's wow. Year goes by fast. As you get, a, here's the secret: as you age, time goes by quicker. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm Albert Einstein with a new theory. Uh, you're not someone who keeps track of time uh, or milestones as you're going. Uh, I used to. Uh, but now, I'm going to whisper, it goes by too quickly to do that. <laughs> you think whispering is going to fool time? You're just trying to trick time into... <laughs> I think it could slow down time a tad. <laughs> if you whisper about it. If I whisper about it, yes. <laughs> well, the podcast is wonderful, uh, yeah, yeah. and I want to talk about uh, the format and the and the way you've uh, you, you've approached the medium in a moment. But first of all, very simply, why why did you get into podcasting, Kevin? Well, um, as I first of all, as I always say, it's the last refuge of the comic scoundrel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the, uh, like, though I'm really busy, um, I'm tired of pitching TV shows and having them say, uh, say no. 
So uh, in a podcast, you can do anything. So it's basically an audio version of the TV show I've been pitching. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, forever. And it started, I, I'm about to tell you the third story of this thing that has no funny uh, funniness in it. That's fine. All right. I, I have very little funniness in me, so I can relate. It's fine. All right. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. Um, uh, my friend Phil from New York. Wow, New York's a theme in this story. <laughs> he, uh, he emailed me. Probably gets there on an aisle seat, I bet, I bet Phil. He's probably in an aisle seat right now. Now the <laughs> bastard, and um, he emailed me because um, uh, he knows I want to hear things on podcasts, but I'm older and I don't know how to do that. Uh huh. So he um, he emailed me the interview Mark Marin had with Todd Rundgren, knowing that I was a Todd Rundgren fan. Mm -hmm. And he uh, and I said, um, Kevin, you like music so much, you should just uh, interview musicians. So sort of like Mark Marin interviews everybody, but just focus on musicians. So we got uh, Forever Dog, my producers. We got them involved, and they thought, because it was me, that we should do it live in front of an audience. And that's when it triggered, well, it's going to be in front of a live audience at a real place in Brooklyn, New York, the Union Hall. Um, I, what I really am is a comedian. Why don't we <laughs> make the interview a small part of it? Yeah, yeah. And, the, and then do my old, uh, what I've been pitching, Jack Benny type show, where there's sketches, and I'll write a funny song, I'll write a sketch every... Um, uh, every show, uh, I'll do a monologue, and then um, uh, I'll have a guest. I'll have a comedy guest and a musical guest, and it grew from there. That's yeah. my boring story of how it all started. No, no, that's a, it's a fine story, and it's a, it's a, so what it is for people who don't know, and it's a, it's unusual, I think, on some level for the format. Uh, to have someone of your caliber doing a variety show right. as a podcast. I mean, were, were there things you said? And Tom Papa's doing one, too. I swear yeah. to God, I didn't know that until after. I swear to God. But Tom Papa sort of has it. Come to Papa? Come to Papa? Is it Tom Papa or Tom Papa? Tom I think Papa. it's Papa. Yeah, Papa. Tom yeah. Papa, come yeah. to Papa. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, very funny, obviously, he is. And he has a variety show like that. Um, uh, no, his is more hip and cool. Yeah, I mean, comedy bang bang has uh, yeah. is in this realm as well, of course, and they're very well established. But I do think that you, I mean, I'm a, I, I haven't established this to you yet. Uh, I mentioned that I, I know who the weaker thens are. Yes. And Guy Madden, uh, Kids in the Hall, deeply meaningful to me. And I know you get this all the time oh, from from nerds, but like I saw you, I've seen you a few times, and wow. I the show means a lot to me. I saw you on the first tour when the show ended, actually when the TV show ended. I was at the oh, wow. Center in the Square in Kitchener, Ontario, and you're... Wow, you like to come to Canada. Well, I, I am in Canada. I don't have to come to Canada. I oh, live, I thought uh, you lived in New York. No, 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 no. I live in Guelph. I live in Guelph, Ontario. Oh, by the way, I'm coming to Guelph uh, to teach and perform. They're having a festival there on September 1st and 2nd. What? I didn't know that. Are you? That's in, that's amazing. Wow. Like, uh, like all my things, they're probably not advertising it. <laughs> <laughs> Is this with the making box? The yes. local? Yes. Okay. I was about to look it up. Um, I'm sorry I screamed in your ear. No, no, that's fine. I'm used to you screaming in my ear. It's been yeah, yeah, 25 it's years of you screaming. Already, uh, you're already used to me screaming in your ear. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh excellent. Uh, yeah, well, I'll see you in Guelph then. Yeah, well, well that's, that's the, we, we have more to talk about. I, I don't want to okay, don't no no please don't <laughs> get on a plane in your window seat and leave me alone here. Right. No no I uh, I was going to say uh, this is a medium that uh, obviously you say it's the last refuge of sure. comic scoundrels, but this was a lot like what happened. I don't want to take people too far back, but you know radio yeah. was actually the first medium. For comedians, after the nightclub circuit, they got all worn out. Before television, I'm taking us way back into the absolutely, 20th century. Absolutely, absolutely. There were uh, there were a lot of older uh, comics. Um, I'm taking over your story because I'm a rude Canadian, and, um, <laughs> As and am they I. got radio shows because they didn't know the radio was going to take off, and then radio took off, and that's when they started getting the younger, like Jack Benny and Bob Hope, um, and and the radio became TV. Yes, exactly. And I do think that there's a parallel between what is happening with podcast. You say last refuge or whatever you said. I can't remember the last refuge uh, because it's, uh, I'm quoting. I am bastardizing a famous Oscar Wilde. Quote. Yes, it's of course. Yes, yes, of course. But I do think that what's happened with podcasting in the last I don't know five ten years is really. Uh, it parallels what happened with radio. It really has rescued people from obscurity uh, and yes. given people the power. Mark Maron, who's been known forever, all of a sudden is a superstar. Yes, yes. A and um, and uh, what's his name? At Midnight, Chris. He's a friend of mine. I'm forgetting his last name. Cause Hardwick. I'm yes. Um, yeah, he, he, he was known for a while, and now he's a rich superstar. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, podcasts are totally valid, and I am kidding when I say Last Refuge of the Comic <laughs> Scoundrel uh, a bit. But it gives you, like you said, like you're tired of people 
rejecting you and your ideas, this yeah. gives you the forum to do whatever you want. Yeah, you can create it yourself. You don't even lose money. Uh, if it doesn't go well, you don't make money. Yeah. But, um, but you don't really, uh, unless you put money into that you don't have to, you can decide to lose money, but you don't have to lose money. And uh, so it's an easy way. But, uh, but there's got to be a future. I, you know, my time on this earth, uh, I only have, what, 30 years left if, I, if, if I'm really healthy. I think you're being generous there, but yes, yeah, that's probably I, right. I said if. Okay. I, uh, imagine I wrote it and I underlined if. I really emphasize the if. If I'm really, really healthy. Uh, well, that's the year Kurt Vonnegut died uh, right. when he was 86. So uh, I, I think I'm healthier than Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, I, I would th think so. It's certainly at 86. Yeah, I think yeah. at this point now, yeah, you are. Well, yeah, now, but, you know, but I have to tell you. Anyway, um, <laughs> so someone has to <laughs> take podcasts to the next level. It just can't be two guys talking about um, uh, a movie they saw once um, or, or two guys talking about Ivan Reitman for like every half hour or every hour a week um, and I'm not the answer because a variety show like that's, a, for the, uh, that's old from radio as we've been discussing but there's, there's got to be an answer to take the po podcast to the next level um, as the way the radio did when it became TV and what, what happened with TV. Well, I don't know what the answer is, though. Well, that, that's an interesting point, because I do think... I, I've been surprised. I mean, I do a conversation uh, podcast myself. Uh, occasionally, I do a live variety show as well. It's there you a, go. I try to. I think you're right. I think there's you've got to shake it up a little bit. And I've noticed, like, I was listening to your, your Susanna Hoffs interview, yeah. and uh, which is, I think, an anomaly on some level, like the straight one-on-one <laughs> -on -one interview, right? I mean, you, yeah. you've mostly been doing these crowd things. But this, this bridge between confessional conversation and comedy, it makes sense to me as someone who follows comedy, because a lot of comedians do this. Are you surprised how much this has resonated with general audiences these i mean you kind of took a little dig at that notion of two two guys just gabbing at each other about something yeah no no i, I am a little surprised and i'm not stabbing you that that guy i love that yeah um, and yeah. when podcasts were invented um uh, at the very beginning that seemed the obvious thing to do uh just to talk i'm more interested in one-on-one -on -one interviews than um uh but this is just my personal taste than two people talking about one movie every week or something like that. Sure. Uh, but, that, to me, is like a hook for like a Saturday Night Live sketch. Yeah. But what was it about... I, I know you love music, but what was it about... the Why musicians? Why did you think about interviewing... Because that hasn't actually totally happened with the show, right? It's not just... No, no. <laughs> that's the small part. And now, because I'm writing uh, like uh, too much <laughs> for each podcast, I don't even interview the musicians anymore, and that's why <laughs> we're going to have the um, smaller one-on-ones every now and then. Right, right. Okay, so clearly you are approaching this as someone who had things they liked about the medium and things they didn't like, things they thought they could do differently and better. I'm not, not better. I would never say better. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the hope is better. Uh, the hope is better, but I'm not that cocky that would think it's better. Um, and I didn't approach it that way. I'm going to show podcasts a thing or two. I'm thinking <laughs> that now as I, as I do them. Um, I'm just thinking the thing, the first thought, like it grew into the form that I think I could, that I could best present myself. Yeah, yeah. And, and a sketch, a monologue, a song, uh, I guess. Throw in an interview, I was uncomfortable with that at first because it's not what I do, but I now I'm enjoying it more and more when, uh, as I do it. Tell me about the monologues. These are the, this is the most I've learned about you and your life other yeah. than kind of residual stuff from Kids in the Hall sketches. Like I kind of know... Some a lot of that was born of your your life experience, but this you know you're just telling. You often say, "I don't know, this is going to be funny," but you tell <laughs> yeah. these amazing stories about your life. What made you want to do that aspect of of your show? Uh, it's funny because um, I think it all starts with a few years ago because I moved to Winnipeg. I started doing stand up um, before I figured out how to make a living in Winnipeg, and I, I was bad at it because the stuff that I wrote wasn't really stand up; it was stories. And, of course, there are a lot of stand-ups who just tell stories, but they're better at it. And they started younger, and they come from it, and their stories come from a stand-up kind of way. Mine were sort of just stories. Uh, I was once so brave at a Yuck Yucks in Calgary two years ago, I tried a new 35-minute story. Uh, just start, <laughs> and the, uh, the audience um, was, I survived the first show, but the late show was sort of young, drunk people who didn't know who I was. And at one point uh, during it, they, um, some woman yelled, uh, for Christ's sake, tell us jokes. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was pleading. It wasn't even mean. It was like she was drowning, and she was like pleading for help. And um, and so I, but I had all these monologues, and more than that, 
I had all the desire to do monologues uh, in a form. Um, what's nicer than people coming to see me? Yeah. Uh, so they're going to be open-minded. And actually, that, that monologue that I'm talking about, the bombed in Calgary, um, got into the show, uh, got into the podcast, and did all right. It did well. I, I cut a lot of it. It wasn't 35 minutes. Yeah, but, yeah. But me at the grocery store. And um, uh, I forget the original uh, <laughs> question. Uh, but, but that's sort of the, how the monologue um, the thing. Uh, it's me doing stand-up badly, and then I realized that I was really enjoying stories. And I personalize it. Um, um, everything is about myself. I guess I'm an egomaniac. But, um, but mostly, um, some things are just like imagination, but most things are about my drunk dad or about my ex-wives or about the fact that I moved to Winnipeg and I don't live in Los Angeles anymore. Yeah. Um, it's just easier for me to write about myself. Uh, John Lennon, I love his I Am The Walrus. I love it. But later, <laughs> when he's doing his solo album and he's talking about quitting the Beatles and now that he's with Yoko and that he's scared, I love that! Right, right. Uh, sorry for screaming, but you're used to it. And I want to do comedy versions of John. I want to do over and over comedy versions of John Lennon's first solo album. You know, you keep apologizing for screaming. You mentioned John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Are you into primal scream therapy? Uh, I never tried it. It, it sounded interesting. Um, but uh, you, uh, do you have to keep doing it? Because he was um, he found himself for a little bit, and then he had those lost year that lost year in L.A. And he left Yoko. Um, like it didn't solve his problems. It seemed that only having a baby really <laughs> solved this problem. Right, baking bread, taking right. r- 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 you know, uh, uh, taking a respite from the public life exactly. is what and helped then, him. Yeah. And if he had lived, would he have gotten more problems, and, uh, and then they would have split up or something? Um, I don't know. He has the perfect rock and roll life, I always think. You think so, eh? D- yeah. Gone by 40? Per- if you're into martyrs, he had the perfect rock and roll life. Um, uh, he got famous in his early 20s. Yeah. He was in the biggest band ever. And not only were they the biggest band ever, but they were actually good. Right. Nowadays, I don't think it, the biggest band ever will ever be actually good. Or more than good, great. More than great, revolutionary. And then he went solo. Uh, he had five years, uh, mostly good albums. Then he quit for five years. Yeah. Came back, had a really good album, and got shot. That's the best. I, I don't want him shot. I want him to be living forever. But if you think of it as in terms of a story, that's a great rock and roll story, as I, sad as it is. I suppose that's true. And, and since you alluded to the Beatles, let's talk Not about... I want him shot. I want him to be alive right now. No, no, I, I think that's clear. I don't think anyone thinks that you want John Lennon to be shot... No. ...again. No. <laughs> Definitely not a I think the damage has been done. But speaking of the Beatles, yes. let's talk about the Beatles of comedy. Finally. The, yes, the kids. Monty in, Python. No, the kids in the hall. Oh, I no. want to talk about the Canadian Beatles of comedy. I'll even let's talk about Ontario, Toronto, Ontario's Beatles of comedy. Yeah, that's that's good. The more specific you get, uh, <laughs> Mississauga's the Beatles, because of course Monty Python and the Beatles of comedy. The kids in the hall are only the Duran Duran of comedy. All right. Well, let's. What I was go- where I was going was. You are known for being part of a troupe. You are known for working uh, alongside, certainly Dave Foley. Yes. As a writing partner. You are now, like John Lennon, uh, you haven't been shot, but you have gone solo. Yes. And and I'm curious, do you have a sounding board? Do you have someone you are working? Because I listen to the podcast, and I can tell, in many instances, you're presenting something, it seems, for the first time. Yes. And you're not sure if it's going to work, and sometimes it's sort of, you Does get a, a mild laugh, and you're like, oh, I didn't think this was going to be funny, but, and you keep going, and it's very fascinating to me. It's very raw. Do yeah, you? Do you? that's ha- totally what's happening. That's yeah. totally what's happening. Do you have a sounding board uh, before you take the stage? Do you? I don't. I don't. And I'm now used to it. I'm now comfortable with it. I, at first, I thought, oh, should I send this stuff to Bruce and to Dave? and uh, get their notes, because they would love to do that yeah. um, if they have the time. And then I thought, for whatever reason, no, that's kind of selfish. Um, uh, and I have the ability, this is not a sounding board, but when I'm writing and I have the ability, I work for them uh, and work, because we're still together, um, So for so long, I could, uh, if I'm stuck with a joke, I could say, what would Dave do? What would be a Dave joke? Or well, Mark would have a weird idea. What would Mark's word be? And sort of think of something. In a way of getting inspired, but oh, I see. You kind of conjure them creatively. Uh, yeah, because I know them so well, and it sort of inspires something out of me. Right. Uh, most of the time, but as a sounding board, that's a very interesting question. I, uh, I am like up there on that diving board, <laughs> that, uh, well, hoping there's water in the pool because um, uh, I don't like I don't go test it out at a, at the Winnipeg Comedy Club rumors or any which would bomb. People would yell for Christ's sake, tell me jokes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, these monologues, I mean, you could pepper them with some more jokes if you wanted, couldn't you? 
Um, you know what? I'm joke dry. Like, uh, like I'm not a joke guy. Yeah. Um, uh, which is another reason why this should be a, like a visual a TV show, because um, a lot of it is how I tell the story. Yeah, yeah. You, you get maybe you get two thirds out of that by listening to it, but you sort of have to see my whole body. <laughs> but I'm enjoying writing it, and I try my best to write jokes. This one, like we're doing two podcasts in New York uh, this Friday, this Saturday. Right. Uh, this Friday, uh, because they, they want, uh, and rightfully so, the producers want more product. Right. So, um, but we only had three weeks, so I only wrote one podcast, and they wrote another one. Uh, they wrote the second one. Theirs is better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and mine is really, I talked myself into a block. A writer's block is what, what happened. Uh, I did, the good thing uh, the, that I have with writer's blocks is I ignore them and I write anyway. Right. Um, but I couldn't think of jokes, and it's very dry. I had a good idea, but I still... Maybe you can help me with jokes. Me? No, I don't. Well, sure. This would be an uh, honor. I, I, I will try. I keep cutting it. My favorite part of the podcast... Sorry that I'm just talking and you're not talking. I'll, sh- I'll shut up. In no, a no, no, no. This is the way it should be. All I, right, this, right. By the way, and I want to ask you about interviewing people, because I, I, I think... You and I could have a, a, at least a brief conversation about that because I think that's fascinating. But please continue. Yes, uh, my favorite part. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. That's fun. My favorite part <laughs> of the, <laughs> the podcast are the po- parts. The uh, is the part that bombs the most. That never gets laughed. I uh, have lots of fun writing for the announcer. Right. <laughs> uh, but it's always way too long, and I, it only has a ghost of a chance of working if I did it, not because I'm the best comedian in the world, but because I wrote it in my voice. Right, and you have some really interesting announcers, like Michael Showalter has been an announcer. Yeah, I, he, was, he was very sweet. Uh, I wrote a, st- uh, a whole thing where he insulted me, and he didn't read the script right before the show, so right before the show he told me uh, I made a few cuts and uh, <laughs> pages and pages of X's. Like there was nothing left. <laughs> uh, and he was very sweet. And he was very nice, and it's because he didn't want to uh, like insult me. I like like I understood. Uh, <laughs> so I gave it to Dana Gould, uh, the next show, who had no problem insulting me. Right. What is the What is the impulse to to write these? Uh, I'm always self-effacing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, the the but the announcer thing, the, the impulse to write the announcer, it, it, for some reason, it's just new and fun to write, and it never works out. So the one I have for uh, this the podcast for, uh, I'm doing Friday in New York, um, he's a writer. So he writes. Um, he, he writes his um, uh, his own announcing. Okay. And he explains to the audience that it's, it's his job to explain uh, what Kevin McDonald is doing because he's a physical comedian. Right. That old shtick. And then I come out and I just have him say very writerly and dark stuff. But I haven't really thought of any funny jokes for it. Do you know what I'm going for? <laughs> I think I understand what you're saying. With yes. The color of blue irises and white skin that the sun loves, <laughs> like 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 overwrite <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> okay, so like, you... I think it's a good idea. Right. But, but and I've cut it down to only three paragraphs. But there's really no hard jokes in it. Right. Well, I mean, but that's the joke. There's a, this but is that's a very the joke. that's right. You know what? You're so smart. <laughs> I yelled again. That's sort of the joke with my jokes. That there's uh, yeah, and uh, some. Sometimes the joke of my jokes means there's no jokes. That's right. It's a very meta podcast. Yes. Like you have Mike Myers on to do a, a, a ostensibly to to narrate a sketch, and he's just talking about how the sketch can't get going. Yes. And that's very that's very fascinating. That's very nuts and bolts. Like it's like a it's like a peek behind the curtain. If if you are the Wizard of Oz, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, I always love that stuff. Um, when I was a kid, you know, when I was ten, I liked Jerry Lewis. Yeah. And very quickly at thirteen. I switched to Andy Kaufman. Right. And I always think I'm a combination of Jerry Lewis and Andy. I'll do the cheapest stuff to get a laugh, but also then I would like to explain to the audience why I felt I had to write this cheap thing. Right. Um, and the writing process, which is Andy Kaufman to me. And um, that's what interests me the most. Jerry Lewis and Andy Kaufman squeezed and forced and pressed together. <laughs> that's the kind of comedy I like. Well, how has interviewing people been for you? Uh, what, has that been a challenge for you? Because I, I have uh, been doing this a long time, and uh, I've learned a lot just in editing my podcast, you know, listening back to be like, oh, God, Vish, huh? why are you talking when that person's talking? I was listening to your Susanna Hoff's interview, and that occurred to me a few times that... Yes. I that, talked over. Well, not you're doing it to me now, Kevin. What are I'm you? Sorry. No. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm kidding. No, I'm I'm curious about your because that's that's new for you, right? Interviewing people. Yes. And how are you finding it? Um, my first thought was, um, you know, channel Jack Parr and <laughs> and Johnny Carson, Steve Allen, in the sense, and uh, Johnny Carson, of course, is the perfect example. Um, it's been spoken about many times, but. But my definition of Johnny Carson being a good uh, host was 
that he was funny, but he actually listened. That's that's exactly what I was going to say because I I heard yourself I heard you catching yourself. And how many times did you say to Susanna Hoffs, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I'm so excited. I want to talk about this thing, yeah. which is, I think, part of your personality. But the one thing I've learned is is to try and uh, that's a hard thing to just listen to people. I know. It's very and that's di- the battle. Yeah. That's a constant battle. I'm getting a little, there's a fraction of an inch better, but I have many miles to go. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky that my first guest was Wallace Shawn, yes. who had no idea how funny he was, um, who no, had no idea how great his stories were, was, uh, had a really shocked and surprised look in his face every time he got a laugh. <laughs> and it was easy to let him go. Yeah, well, he actually says, I've, I've, this is, I've never done interviews, or he, he thought yeah. all of them had been bad, I think is what the quote yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how he talked him into it. I, I don't think he knew the kids in the hall were or anything. Like oh, that. interesting. I don't know. You know what I also need about that is that Brad Roberts was on that show. Yes. And uh, yes, I knew the Superman was a good song. Yeah. I bought the album in 94, whatever year it was. Yeah. Uh, or 92, maybe? Who cares? This, for and, people listening, this is uh, Brad Roberts of the Crash Test Dummies. Yes, uh, yeah. if there's people listening. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, but watching him do it live, uh, just on acoustic guitar, was like a moment in my life that I will remember more than any of my weddings. Oh. It was like a spe- like that. And then you really get the song. This is how he wrote it. This is what he really meant. Yeah. And, and, it's, uh, and I always liked the song, but it was a great moment. And Wallace Shawn started crying. And now, because uh, <laughs> Wallace Shawn and uh, Brad are two smart people who live in New York, they are friends now. Oh, now. that's remarkable. See, that's the great thing about podcasting. It, it yeah. creates community. It does. Yeah, it totally does. I want to... smart uh, and living in New York. That's all they needed. <laughs> <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about contemporary sketch troops and TV shows. Are there any that you've been impressed by? Because I think of you as an expert in that field, for sure. Yes. No one can tell you how to do that. Is there anyone that you like or admire? Yeah, I've been impressed. You know, when the, there were sketch shows out during the early 90s, when the kids in the hall were on, um, I didn't like any of them. And I realized now it was because I was in my angry young man. We're the best. No one's as good as us. Yeah. So yeah. I ignored the state. Um, uh, like I saw one sketch and go, well, I knew they were bad, <laughs> which is not true. When and I, I know that I, I should, um, are there still DVDs around? That yeah, I just ordered the state on DVD uh, uh, last year, actually. Well, I should do that and give them a chance. The second the kids in the hall was um, uh, canceled, um, I started liking sketch shows. Uh, Mr. Show was great. Yeah. I think Chappelle's show is one of the best ever. Yeah. Because um, it had a really strong point of view. Which is a very important in sketch comedy. Yes, and and also created a form that'll be copied forever. Um, and I, has I been copied. About the sketch first and yeah. shows the sketch. Yeah, and it has been copied. I think a lot by things uh, like Inside Amy Schumer and yeah. Key and Peele for sure. And uh, Key and Peele, uh, yeah, which I also think is perfect sketch. I think Key and Peele is technically perfect. Yes, you, you do. You love it. I it, I do love it. It's technically perfect. Um, they don't have quite the uh, the point of view. Of, uh, of other shows, maybe like the kids in the hall, who might have said that. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's amazing that everything they do, everything that you, every ingredient that you need in a sketch, yeah. they do perfectly. Um, whether it's the premise, the hook, as we used to call it, yeah. whether it's the characters, whether it's performing it and getting it, even, um, they even excel at the hardest thing in sketch comedy, and that's the ending of a sketch. Tell me, you, you just said that kids in the hall had a particular point of view. I'm just curious, from your own from your own perspective like what what was that point of view exactly yes and this uh, and if you talk to the others they would all give you different uh, examples of the point of view but i'll give you mine sure i've thought about it obviously alone in bed 3 a.m. 3 a.m. weeping it's a uh, lot of detail i didn't expect that much detail kevin uh, no. uh, i think a lot of it has to do with uh, four of us grew up in the suburbs um we mostly all had drunk dads yeah and i think the suburbs have something to do with it we were all like 30 miles away from the city uh, we were, we're all 30 miles away from um, the, like something we wanted to be part of. Right. Um, and I, I think being distant um, and, and being the person not involved in the action has something to do with it. The drunk dads definitely. I think we're all looking for a daddy figure. Some kind of approval. Some kind of approval, yeah. And uh, over the years, we've been through many daddies, men and women, yeah. who, who would direct us on stage and we would fire. And then, um, uh, then on TV show, who you fire. Um, and it, our point of view sort of has a happy ending that we found a great daddy, uh, our director and producer eventually by the end of season one, John Blanchard. Yeah. Who's, uh, no one knows, but he's like the, um, arguably, 
and I wouldn't even say arguably, the greatest sketch di- um, TV sketch director ever. He did SCTV, he did Codco, yeah. he did The Kids in the Hall, he did the first good, uh, few good years of Mad TV. Um, uh, like, he's the best. And more than that, he was a good daddy. Hmm. Um, he was the one guy that could say no to The Kids in the Hall, and we'd accept it. Oh, okay. So, so you, and is, is, do you still correspond with John? We don't. He's, uh, he's sort of retired, and we've tried to get in touch with him a few times. He's a quiet man. Right. <laughs> well, what is up with uh, kids in the halls? Uh, kids in the hall these days. Well, uh, there's like a, uh, there's some interest from the outside world of us str- streaming. I think that's a new word. That is a new word. Yeah, that that word has not been uh, uttered until just now. Streaming. It's stre- yeah, streaming. Did I pronounce that correct? Yeah, streaming. Streaming. Uh, yeah. Is, is streaming. Uh, <laughs> like we have so many new sketches from our last few specials. The, why don't we like do a live special that we stream on something? Oh, okay. Uh, but it's hard to get us uh, five together, and also we could probably the way that Mr. Show went on Netflix with new episodes, we could probably do something like that on something like Netflix or Amazon or yeah, something. Yeah, okay. So you're con- you're <coughs> contemplating such things. We're contemplating, but it's been a year and a half, and the uh, conference calls have stopped. So it'll probably be another thing that will die. But um, you know, hopefully, we can somehow muster that before before we die. Okay. Well, that's that's not morbid at all. That's a pleasant <laughs> thought. Thank you. What is up with this benefit show you're part of featuring Bob and Doug and SCTV? Uh, it's sort of a reunion for SCTV members. Yes. Some um, of the kids in the hall are involved. Yes. Um, uh, we got a call from Dave Thomas. A very sad thing happened. His, um, his nephew, um, who lives somewhere in northern Ontario, I think, he's around 40 and he, was, um, he had a snowmobile accident. Yes, and, I heard about this. Very yes. sad. Yeah, and uh, he was paralyzed, and so we, um, uh, so uh, everyone from SCTV, I think everyone, and three kids in the hall, Scott, Dave, and I are going to do a benefit show, uh, and 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 try to raise some money mm-hmm. uh, for his needs, and um, so that part's sad. Obviously, to see SCTV together, um, it, that's also exciting, and hopefully, the excitement of that will get more money for what the benefit's really about. But it will be exciting to see Martin Short host, and yeah. the Kenzie brothers are doing a thing again. And and so, do, have the so I, why is it only the three of you, by the way? Uh, I think um, Mark and Bruce would have done it in a heartbeat. I just uh, think uh, Mark's Mark will be. Uh, they start filming Superstore pretty early. Oh yeah, so he's on that American sitcom. Yeah, yeah, that's he's right. an American sitcom. Yeah, and uh, Bruce um, is directing uh, uh, Shit's Creek. And then he goes straight to something else right after that. Okay, so so there's no. It's just it just. I figured it was a scheduling thing. Do the, do the three of you, Scott and Dave and yourself, do you know what you're going to do? Yes, we do. It's funny because the three of us. Um, it's worked out uh, in the past year. The three of us have done a few things: the Calgary Festival, the uh, San Francisco Sketch Fest. But for some reason, we're not doing. Not for some reason. For a good reason, we're not doing those things we've done. There's a sketch that we used to do called Pinter, uh, that we never did on TV. That was a state sketch, and it was the three of us, and it was a big hit. We just couldn't. Um, if you saw it, I don't want to bore you with what it's about. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it makes no. I bored you with lots of other things. You're not but. boring. This has been fantastic for me. Thank you for your time. Don't thank, don't feel bad. We're not doing Pinter. We're doing our greatest hits. Uh, Scott's going to do a Buddy Cole, and uh, the, thank you for your time. And Dave and I are going to do uh, <laughs> Citizen Kane, the sketch. Oh, not, okay. Not the movie, the sketch. So you're going to do a couple of sketches, and uh, that's the plan. And then uh, yeah, and then watch the show and enjoy it. That's great. Well, that's fantastic. And and you mentioned you've got some tapings coming up this weekend. What else is going on uh, with your podcast? Podcast. By the way, happy anniversary again. If Thank I you very much. It's yeah. very nice that you noticed. Yeah. Uh, because I would have forgot. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the podcast will be exciting. Um, uh, the Friday night, on, um, unfortunately for her, on my bad show, the, the script I wrote, um, uh, Sashir Zamata. Oh, Sashir. I just spoke with her. Yeah, that's great. That's neat. Yeah, yeah. She's really funny. I'm excited about that. Yeah. And on Saturday, uh, T.J. Miller is going to be the... Um, uh, really? The, yes. Wow. So you and T.J. Miller together. That is an energy that could power <laughs> uh, I know. The a energy building. could be crazy. It, it'll go either way. It'll either like be us talking over each other or um, <laughs> or sadly, it may go the other way. We're both trying to poli- uh, be polite and not talk. <laughs> I know him a little bit. He was in my very first workshop that I ever gave... Uh, 16 years ago oh and um and then he was on carpoolers that bruce mccullough created and and, and uh who tricked me into being in the writer's room and writing it so i uh, so i know tj a little bit though i haven't seen him for 10 years right okay so and so people realize you know most a lot of podcasts it's like at least once a, a week yours yeah. is 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 different it, uh, the, it's once a month but we're trying to do these um uh since my producers i now know are good writers 
Uh, well, maybe we'll try to do two a month. Okay. All right. And well, then we'll try to do the um, the smaller one on ones. Um, uh, usually, the plan is that when I do a podcast, uh, we get someone to interview, do a one on one. I did Craig. F- I did Stan Hops, as you said, and I did Craig Finn. Yeah. From, uh, I, uh, Craig Finn is the musical guest on the T.J. Miller show, by the way. Oh, okay. Uh, Craig Finn of the Hold Steady. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's amazing. Uh, where can people learn more about uh, about your show, Kevin? Yeah, where? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, the Forever Dog, uh, they have a thing. Is it called .com in the podcast world? Yeah, you could say that, yeah. It's also, I mean, the, the podcast is available in the iTunes store yes. and probably across most podcast platforms, right? Yes. Right, okay, and it's called... iTunes and Forever Dog. And it's called the Kevin McDonald Podcast. It's called the Kevin... It's called Kevin McDonald's Kevin McDonald Show. That's right. That's what it's called. I apologize. I, if I, you put I, Kevin McDonald Podcast, you'd probably get it. You'd probably get it. That's right. Okay, now this... I don't want, I don't want to put you on the spot any more than I already have, but yeah. as we leave, I was thinking I could probably do this. Can I play something where I isolate a bit or a, a thing that happened on your show on my show now so that people can get a little flavor... Of your show, is there something that comes to mind? What 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 would you recommend? Oh, uh, you, you, I, I thought you had the idea already. No, um, I, I that's why I didn't mean to put you on the spot uh, to make you. Re- think, yeah. uh, how long would you? Let, it like, doesn't it matter be? to me. It's the podcast, Kevin. We it's the Wild West. We can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, the Wild West. <laughs> uh, okay, the, the, the I know what gives the flavor the best. Uh, it's sort of me going commercial. The uh, the first episode. Where I tell the El Combo story with Scott Thompson and I. Okay, all right. So that's the first. Okay, I will. I will. It's six or seven minutes long. Is that too long? That is not too long because it's the Wild West, and in the Wild West, <laughs> time didn't matter. It was a flat circle or something. Anyway, well, let's pl- let's play that. And uh, uh, Kevin, this was uh, uh, again. I can't convey to you enough how much you and your work have meant to me. And I, I can't I can't thank you enough for being on my show. That's and nice. I and I wish you the best of luck with everything. You're very good. You're gonna become a talk show host or something, I could tell. And uh, I'll see you in Guelph on September first and second. <laughs> thank you very much. Eight hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> oh and now a beautiful, poignant and touching monologue from Mr. Kevin McDonald. That's me! Wasn't Wallace Shawn amazing? Wasn't Wallace Shawn amazing? Oh, there, that's better. Um, I don't know why I wrote it down, because this is a true story, but I I guess just to make sure I don't forget anything, I am going to tell a true Kids in the Hall story. Kids in the Hall, thank you. I've never met any of them, but I hear they're all very nice. All except the all of them. (laughs) Uh, All right, the true story uh, takes place in October. 1985. Uh, it was two short months after the kids in the hall had been discovered uh, by one Lauren Michaels. Um, he couldn't have all of us work at SNL because uh, there were five of us. He was, no, no, that's ridiculous. They do make me laugh. So we, we knew. But he did hire Mark McKinney and Bruce McCullough, the two oldest and most experienced kids in the hall, as writers. Um, now, due to all the attention we were getting, Dave Foley was cast uh, in a Canadian comedy thriller movie called High Stakes. And I'll never forget Dave telling me that the producer told him that they were going to make him the Canadian Michael J. Fox. (laughs) I think I know what he means. So, (laughs) during October, uh, Mark and Bruce were in Saturday Night Live. They were in New York, uh, which is here. And uh, Dave was in Vancouver uh, being Canadian Michael J. Fox. (laughs) Now, before the kids in the hall were discovered, we had agreed to do a sketch at a benefit for the University of Toronto. Um, and, and this, uh, this benefit, um, we agreed to do it because, uh, we were like looking for gigs. And, um, it was going to be held at the Toronto's famous rock club. I don't know if anybody remembers anymore. The Elma Combo. Um, the Elma Combo is most famous for, uh, that's where Keith Richards was going when he was arrested for doing heroin. <laughs> ah, we all dreamed of being arrested for doing heroin at the Elma Combo. <laughs> But we had to settle for a benefit at a frat show. Uh, so it seemed that only Scott Thompson and I, or as the troop lovingly referred to us, the losers, were in Toronto, so we had to perform the Elma Combo alone. Sure we could do it, thought Scott Thompson and I. Whether it's all five kids in the hall or just the two losers in the hall, the audience is a bunch of college kids. College kids love us. <laughs> Uh, 
When we arrived that night, um, the show had been going on for about an hour. Uh, the first thing we noticed uh, were very drunk college kids. Very, very, very drunk college kids. But the show was going well. The act before us was the University of Toronto's gay choir, and they were killing. Uh, in fact, they got a standing ovation, so we thought, great. Um, if drunk college kids are going to give a, a, a gay choir a standing ovation, then we've got it made. <laughs> When we were introduced, uh, they gave us nice college kid, drunk college kid applause. We entered the stage and began our sketch. Now, the sketch involves Scott Thompson and I talking humorously. Uh, we make up a story of how I, uh, I have just split up with my girlfriend, how she just left me. Uh, and as we talk, I pretend to look into the audience and supposedly see my ex-girlfriend sitting with her new boyfriend. This, of course, is a ruse. We've done this sketch a million times. I just randomly pick a couple uh, that is sitting close to the stage, pretend that the woman is my ex-girlfriend, and that she has started dating the jerk that she is sitting with. What usually happens next, uh, in order to get me time alone with the woman, Scott riding on the wave of uproarious laughter that we most assuredly are getting, <laughs> takes the man on stage and hits on him uh, to give me time with my girlfriend. And he tapes something disgusting that he pretends that the guy from the audience says, so he makes the guy say overtly sexual stuff. And it's usually quite hilarious. Uh, it's worked millions of times. It always gets millions of laughs. Only this time, we never get to the part uh, where I get the guy on stage for Scott to hit on him. Uh, to my horror, I have chosen an unnecessarily drunk woman who isn't laughing or playing along like they usually do. She is, in fact, pushing me and telling me in her best college-educated elocution to quote-unquote, fuck off. <laughs> she goes as far as to look at my long, curly hair and call me hair asshole. <laughs> she, in fact, leans right into the mic and calls me hair asshole. <laughs> this gets the first laugh of the sketch. <laughs> In an obvious attempt to straighten my unruly curly hair, she begins to pound my head with the mic over and over and over. The audience, now seemingly angry with Scott and I, begin to chant, fags, fags. Remember, this is the crowd that just gave a gay choir a standing ovation. But at us, they're throwing homophobic slurs. We haven't even gotten to the gay part of the sketch yet. I see in the corner of the club that even a couple of members of the gay choir are chanting, fags, fags. It's not going well. As I continue to have my hair pummeled by the curly hair hater, the next act comes on stage. They are a three-piece punk band called Gut Rot. Unaware that we're still performing, they start doing a sound check. An angry Scott, who is still on stage, starts yelling at the bass player. The musician puts down his bass and starts yelling back at Scott. Meanwhile, the woman is still hitting me, telling me to fuck off, you hair asshole. Her super drunk boyfriend now gets in the act, starts screaming at her, stop flirting with that hair asshole. I knew you were seeing someone else. Now the couple turn away from me and start to yell at each other. I, a professional coward, decide to quit the performance and slink off to the bar to order a comfort margarita. No one seems to notice or care. The MC comes in stage and stands in front of Scott and the bass player who are now furiously pushing each other. The MC says it's now time for a contest and the winner gets the new Billy Crystal album, You Look Marvelous. <laughs> the crowd cheers. They love Billy Crystal. Why isn't he here instead of those two hair assholes? The MC continues. To win, you just have to answer the following question. What song did both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones record? I know the answer. I have both albums. When I was a kid, my crazy Aunt Mimi gave these albums to me because she had her second nervous breakdown and was blaming it on rock and roll. <laughs> I know the answer, so I shout out loud, I want to be your man! The MC looks at the crowd, sees me, pauses, smiles, and quickly yells, We have a winner! Come on stage and get your Billy Crystal album, young man! I rush back on the stage. The audience applauds, somehow forgetting that I am hair asshole. <laughs> I pass Scott uh, and the bass player now spitting on each other. 
I go to the MC, I get my Billy Crystal album. The audience continues cheering. I turn to the audience, proudly holding my Billy Crystal album, and I tell them, you look marvelous. I get my first laugh of the night. The audience goes crazy with applause. I pass the bass player, who now has gotten a headlock, and they wrestle around the stage, knocking over the drums. I return to my margar margarita, happily sip from it. I scan the world-famous Elma Combo at the wrestling Scott, at the couple yelling at each other, the MC, the angry gay choir, and the entire crowd. It's true. Everyone does indeed look marvelous. True boring story. Thank you very much. The hilarious Kevin McDonald. That was an excerpt from the first episode of his podcast, Kevin McDonald's Kevin McDonald Show. I have to say, I already said it, huge thrill to have Kevin on the program. Uh, you know, we've had uh, Bruce McCullough on the show before. We've had Scott Thompson on the show twice, technically, before. So we just need, now that we've had Kevin, we just need uh, Mark McKinney and Dave Foley to join us, and then we've completed our Kids in the Hall duty and I'm not sure what happens after that. I guess uh, we move on to the state or somebody like that. Anyway, huge thrill. Thank you, Kevin, for being on the program. That was really fun. This is the 333rd episode of Creative Control, a podcast available on many fine platforms, including iTunes, Audio Boom, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Overcast, Lots of different options. It's also available on my website, uh, vishkana.com, where you can go to learn more information about me and the show. We're on Facebook. Like our page on Facebook. We're on Twitter, at Vish Creative. I'm on Twitter, at vishkana. Also, a version of this show airs every Wednesday at noon Eastern Standard Time around the world at cfru.ca, or you can tune in to us on the actual radio at 93.3 FM in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. Also, please feel free to visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep the podcast going. I have some t-shirts that I can send you in return for your efforts, so please consider that. This episode would not be possible without our sponsors, Pizza Trocadero, whom you can call for pickup or delivery at 519-829-2444, or check them out at trocaderoguelph.ca. The Bookshelf, an independently owned bookstore, bar, music venue, and movie theater located at 41 Quebec Street in Guelph. Learn more about them at bookshelf.ca. Planet Bean, freshly roasted, fair trade, certified organic coffee. They have three cafes in Guelph. For more information about them, visit planetbeancoffee.com. I think I might take Kevin McDonald to all of these places when he comes to Guelph in September, which I didn't know about until he told me. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if he wants to go. And if there's time, we're going to head on down to Hamilton, Ontario. New sponsor on the show, I'm very pleased to say, Granddad's Donuts, located at 574 James Street North in Hamilton, Ontario. Best donuts anywhere. Visit granddads.ca for more info. We have now covered all the four major podcast food groups, pizza, coffee, donuts, and books. We've done it. Thank you. That's it for me. Thanks for listening to Creative Control. Continue to do so. Tell your friends to do so. Share the show. Download the show. Subscribe to the show. However you do, please. It all helps me sleep at night, maybe. Thank you. I will talk to you soon. Goodbye for now. <laughs>